Going from playing Slay the Spire to Inscription back to back was the greatest form of whiplash I could have asked for. Despite the fact that both of these games are single player roguelike deck builders with suspiciously similar looking maps, they are completely polar opposite experiences. In Slay the Spire, when you rest at a campfire, you receive some much needed healing, as a weary traveler would want to when they're about to fight a giant slime who can't stop using mitosis. But in Inscription, that's where your Pokemon go to die. Unless, of course, this creepy carnivorous caravan isn't hungry. Then the offering won't die even if you wanted to kill them off. In Slay the Spire, your final fight might be against the legendary double donut duo Ornstein and Smo. While in Inscription, you can just get up from the table. Slay the Spire has four unique characters to play as with entirely different deck combination possibilities and playstyles. Meanwhile, in Inscription, you are a nameless victim of circumstance, sat across the table from a shadowy and sadistic 5e dungeon master, battling for your sorry existence, every second ticking away until you inevitably perish alone in this darkened candlelit room, your soul cast away into the shadow realm by Yugimoto himself, dooming you to become a death card to be played for all eternity, or until you uninstall the game. Back when I was 5 years old, I can remember all my friends trading Pokemon cards behind the swing set like a bunch of tiny tot drug dealers. This is not meth. It's holographic. We had no idea at the time how to even play the game, nor do I understand it now. But we all recognized the bad deal when we saw one. The card had to be EX. It had to be shiny when you waved it back and forth. Some of us would go into epileptic seizures from the pure excitement of holding a holographic of Mewtwo with his boy Thanos, brandishing his classic Team Rocket Infinity Gauntlet. Bigger numbers were always better, and a holographic Charizard card that was four times the size of a normal one for absolutely no reason at all definitely meant it was overpowered. Like the great warrior Exodia, you could just slap it down on the board and declare yourself the winner. All this is to say that the beautiful designs on cards are super duper important. Everything is as much about the presentation as it is about the core game philosophy. Just look at the sleek art style and Slay the Spire. Now switch it over to the original MS Paint placeholder art in all its glory. There's an undeniable charm to the simple compositions and rough sketches that would eventually be transformed into clean and sparkly new depictions of the colorful robots, fire-soaked demons, and venomous vials of acid being played in the game today. Everything is meant to be bright and readable, which is very helpful to all the speedrunners out there who play this game with their eyes closed. Each class is very distinct with a different color for each potential pool of cards to choose from. First, you have your classic base guy, the Commando from Risk of Rain 2, the Soldier 76 from Overwatch, Slay the Spire's Ironclad. While he is a fantastic first character for absorbing the rules of the game, he is anything but standard. Initially, the coolest part about him is he has a little more health by default and can heal to help you survive the Crucible, but then you realize it's actually just more health for the game to take away from you. His deck consists of red cards, which apparently all just want to delete themselves. Every other card is exhausted or wants to be exhausted. By the end of the game, you're not actually supposed to have any cards at all. You just have to beat up the massive demon heart with your classic ironclad fisticuffs. I've had more than a few fun runs with this character trying to push my strength to something absurd or using curse and status cards against their masters, but somehow all that's vanilla compared to some of the insanity of the other classes. The Silent Huntress is the second playable character in Premier Waifu. which is why she gets to draw two extra cards. She loves pumping enemies full of toxic green sludge and watching their health meters drop to the floor. It's deliciously satisfying to watch a monster get vanquished right as they start their turn. Discarding cards can be turned into a plus against curses and used to set up combos. And most crucially of all, if your hand is made up of doo-doo garbage, just replace them all with trusty shivs. Now the enemy is a bunch of tiny little pieces and you just got the exhaustion achievement, even though you're not playing ironclad. The exhaustion guy. This is the defect. He's my boy. Unlike every other character, he uses these special orbs for passive effects and eventually some of the most insanely powerful combos. By default, he starts with his classic lightning orb, which does 3 damage each turn and 8 if you activate it. But with frost, darkness, and plasma orbs, things will quickly spin out of control. This is what I like to call Godform Zenyatta, but even more based. Into the ice. I will not juggle my balls. One of my favorite runs of all time, I remember just playing all the cards, every single one, one after another. They just kept popping up, and with an excessive amount of energy, every card that jettisoned into my hand played a role in utterly obliterating the other side. In those moments, I truly felt like an unthinking machine, tasked with delivering death down the assembly line, because I had no idea what I was doing. Immersive character, 10 out of 10, IGN. Finally, you have the Watcher on the wall. She has four stances. Well, five actually. Neutral, meditative, enraged, her ultimate Karate Kid stance, divination, and, if you're feeling spicy, death. 
Floating between each of these different states, she can play the hard way or the easy way. She often chooses both. There is no character that can dish out the godlike damage in a single turn like she can consistently. However, there's also no other character that gets bitch slapped harder than she does consistently. With the ability to maximize the damage across the board, she becomes the ultimate double-edged sword. Her strategy is often to hold on for dear life, and then once the stars align, release the Kraken. She's by far the most complicated for me to play, so my usual no thoughts head empty approach only gets her killed. But that makes the magical moment you crack the code and play the cards in perfect order that much sweeter. Looking for lethal literally every turn becomes a puzzle in itself. Although with the combination of my luck and math skills, I'll be off by one and get my head chopped off. Well, now that we've chosen our character, how do we actually play? Well, in the classic Hero's Journey by James Campbell, you meet a wise old wizard named Gandalf the Grey, or Dumbledore. In this game, it's a whale. Apparently, this guy's name is Nyao. What is he doing? He's beginning to believe. Anyways, the whale pats you on the back and sends you up the spire. Sorry, wrong map. So you've got enemies, treasure chests, elite monsters, rest sites, and mysterious question marks. But most importantly, at the tippy top, you can see which first act boss is blocking your path. Of course, I completely forget to check every single time. At first, you might be inclined to avoid monster battles at all costs. Health is the most valuable commodity after all, since all damage carries over until you win or die. Enemies are far less welcoming than a treasure chest or a feeble little question mark, until you quickly realize the question marks actually end up getting you killed half the time. The only thing worth it being half a monkey statue you can maybe use later on in the temple. If you can hold your own against a room full of monsters, especially the elites, you will be rewarded with a selection of cards, gold for the gift shop, and even special relics that can change everything about a run. Mitigating damage will always be the aim of the game. You're gonna get sliced and diced. You will always begin with strikes and defends no matter what class, and you will have to rely on these unfortunate cards until they are trashed, replaced, or diluted by a growing deck count. Each class, however, also begins with a reduced set of unique class cards that have a bit more kick. After battles, you can usually pick from a set of three cards and interestingly, you can also choose to skip. Sometimes skipping keeps your deck from becoming too bloated, where the card that would have saved you is actually 40 cards deep in the discard pile. Fighting enemies is a bit of a puzzle. Everything you do is in reaction or anticipation of the enemy's next attack, block, negative effect, or some nasty combination of the two. They can also run away with your money, start out sleeping, become stunned after shaking them around a little too hard, or they're thinking of doing some creepy shit. Use absolutely anything and everything you can get your hands on in order to survive the journey. You're gonna need it. After climbing your way up through the spire, the Act 1 boss will be revealed. The slime can be split in two and then four once you take half its health, but then why not just smite them from existence, literally cutting them down to size? The Guardian likes to curl up into a bitch ball with spikes on the outside, but if he shows his ugly head, make sure you knock it off or you'll get got. And then there's the Hexagon, where the number of green flames determines whether he tackles you or lights you on fire. He's a bitch. But he loves multi-attacks, so maybe use some spiky return fire or an out of control lightning storm. And now for act two. Sorry, wrong one. This game likes to take you to the top of the mountain before kicking you in the balls. Suddenly enemies are tougher, items are becoming more dangerous, and your deck through it all is just getting stupider. For the act two elites, you have Master Hand, but this time he has a knife. An Ewok from Star Wars that made a deal with the devil. And then a Goblin Slaver from your favorite hentai. Meanwhile, the final bosses are either some buff guy in armor who hits really hard, or a spindly little witch who hits even harder. Worst of all, there's always a tug of war between attacking them and killing off their little annoying underlings. What inevitably happens is after I've dispatched Dumb and Dumber, they are conveniently respawned to tell me I'm screwed right before I take a sight to the face, just to twist the knife in that much further. Act 3 is the same story. The difficulty scales across all enemies. Now it hurts to hurt them. Some are more mouth than manners. Some can explode. This Pokemon changes his mind every time you hit him. This one has 999 HP, but he knows he's gonna die in 5 turns so he's got nothing to lose. And some come back if you don't wipe all their siblings out. And that's just the regular enemies. The elites are a giant head, hey, dum -dum, you give me gum -gum. an absolute asshole who you can only tickle with a point of damage unless he's about to kill you, and a snake woman who enjoys poison more than the silent waifu. And finally, the bosses include an abomination with two phases, just like a true Dark Souls boss, Ornstein and Smo reloaded, and a snail who only lets you play 10 cards instead of my usual 200. And we're not even done yet. There's a fourth phase. Only if you gather the three infinity stones through each act to open the final door. Face these two timing goon heads, and finally you get to vanquish the cancerous heart at the top of the spire, unplugging it forever if it doesn't unplug you first. Then on top of that, you have four characters to play, 
place, so you gotta do that four times, not counting all your pitiful failed attempts flying too close to the sun, and then you have an ascension system, 20 different modifiers in total that all try their damnedest to eviscerate any hope or pride you had left. If even after all of that, you finally run out of things to do and slay the spire, I think you're finally ready to try inscription. <laughs> I think. Okay, it's time to figure out what's on this thing. Spoilers ahead. Inscription's first few moments are a simple, very well-structured tutorial, except everything you learn is from the mouth of your captor. A shadowy figure draped in darkness, blazing eyes fixed upon you, only occasionally blinking. Every move you make is tracked by these eyes as he explains the rules of the last game you'll ever play. The voice he uses is little more than a sinister buzzing in your eardrum, creepy and electronic. He's doing everything he can to avoid saying, Shall we play a game? Oh. He treats you with a kind of respect as a player, eager to show off all the wonderful mechanics of his fine game. And even if you get up from the table and explore his cabin, he's not worried about you leaving. He knows the only way you're escaping is to defeat him. While he does seem to relish the time spent playing with you, it doesn't take you very long to figure out just how replaceable you really are. Compared to the colorful hurricane that is Slay the Spire, which is made of combos, potions, and more immediate spell effects, Inscription boasts a 2x4 board leaning squarely on its collection of creatures and monsters. Moves and therefore gameplay possibilities are far more restricted, shaping the atmosphere of the game to be just as tense and suffocating. The rules are simple. Squirrels have no cost to them to be summoned, but must be necessarily sacrificed to summon more dangerous creatures, while the remains are left as bones for the graveyard pile. At the start of your turn, you must choose between drawing from a deck full of monsters or grabbing a new sacrificial squirrel. Without the blood of squirrels, you cannot summon monsters, but without monsters, you have no hope of winning the game. Your life literally hangs in the balance. Taking too much direct damage will tip the scale unless she will snuff out one of your candles, one of the only two lifelines keeping him from strangling you. He can be merciful though. If you don't like a card, give it a vasectomy. Get yourself a literal scapegoat for why you lost. Get a few extra bones that could be used for summoning certain creatures, or receive an extra squirrel for slaughter. These items are not always generously given, but there are card effects and events that will help with these brief power-ups. Leshy looks at himself as your opponent, but also as a dungeon master, leading you tooth and nail through an expedition where he plays every character that you encounter. Take a look at the map. Sorry, wrong one. Whilst trekking through the creepy Bramblewood, your carefully carved character has a few paths to choose from, each with different events that they can land on. Leshy will greet you with a different mask donning his face for each NPC he's embodying, bright shining eyes leering out at you. He could be the woodcarver, who will offer an effect for whatever tribe of monster you choose, the trapper, who deals in teeth into pelts into beastly cards, the prospector, who strikes at one of three boulders, or my favorite, the mycologist, who splices duplicate cards together as best they can, making something even more formidable. There are also events for picking new cards, picking what cost you want a new card to be, what tribe they came from. You can sacrifice a card to the bone lord to cut some fat off your deck, or you can try to upgrade a card only for it to get torn apart by a cannibalistic caravan. You can get more items with the little pack rat to boot, or you can sacrifice a card, using its very soul to imbue a powerful sigil on a card more worthy of it. Killing two birds with a single stone, so to speak. Death cards also have their own event, but we haven't died, so I don't think we even have to worry about it. See, Inscription is like an onion. It's got layers. The first person camera is manipulated by the arrow keys, emulating a more classic first person RPG. If you're tired of playing the game with your friend, I mean captor, you head over here and play this game instead, inside the game you're playing, which looks remarkably like the same game. Anyways, you can also adjust the clock. Sometimes you can get a few extra bits for the pelt store later. There's also the safe, this painting. Wonder what this wall's for. Who's that guy? Wow, look at all these rules that are half redacted. What's this? Must not be that important. Oh, that can't be good. Open the safe. And great, you talk too. Now there are two chatterboxes. Sorry, I only have room for one. Incidentally, I just noticed all the cards start shaking when you know someone's gonna be sacrificed. The stoat and the stink bug continue to whisper in your ear, encouraging you to play along with Leshy's game while they think of a plan to rescue their last companion, the stunted wolf, who is also the lost master of Slime Boy over here. Suddenly, there might be a means of escape from forces inside and outside of the game, but you are the spy who needs to remain alive. Guess it's too bad there are some bosses you need to get past first. Like Slay the Spire, each stage has a boss at its end, each with its own unique phases and rule sets. If you 
you manage to beat Leshy through stage one, he will don the mask of the Prospector, providing a packed meal bursting with goodies, but happy to smash your front line of cards into golden nuggets. The second boss is the Angler, with a fish hook for stealing the last card played and will summon bait buckets that attract great white sharks. And finally, there's the Trapper, who's actually the traitor. Trading pelts for cards on his battle lines until all that remain are what you have left to deal with. If you somehow manage to beat all of them, just like in Slay the Spire, there's a fourth phase. But rather than a heart, you're gonna have to defeat Leshy himself, at his most powerful, giving himself every advantage now that there's a chance he might actually lose. But he does give you a fighting chance, if your deck contains the right cards. Use everything you can, but you will fail, if you didn't many times before this. If you beat any of the previous boss's first phases the first time, they would have flooded the board with grizzlies. Leshy being frustrated at how quickly you were barreling through his game. Like a true DM, Leshy can just declare, uh, rocks fall, everyone dies. And he does exactly that. By using his camera, he turns the moon itself into a playable card, a behemoth stretching across the entirety of the board, blocking himself off completely from any damage. Turns out you don't know anything yet. He has more game to show you. He drags you over to the back room and wants to commemorate your valiant efforts by having you construct a new card from the attributes of your old deck, writing a name upon it, and then snapping a picture of you. You are dead. But a new you wakes up, across from Leshy again, apparently a stranger, and both of you begin playing the game from the very start. Up on the wall is your faded death card, along with the death cards of all your previous unfortunate attempts. But with each reset in the cycle, you become more powerful. You find items about the cabin that can help, you have a powerful grasp of the rules of the game, you have more chances, your previous lives weren't just stepping stones, but now integral tools and powerful weapons to take down Leshy. And at some point, you actually win, dispatching the very moon itself and quickly snapping a picture of Leshy with his own camera. Oh my, did I just... I think I just beat him! Only to realize it has no film. Well, fuck. While you are indeed a winner, a dead winner is still dead. Leshy wins once again. But every death you've seen a vision, different each time. A guy in a ghillie suit, painting clues for your next steps. He tells you to use the knife, to pluck your own eye from its socket, and add it to the scale, instantly winning a battle. He looks like a guy who knows what he's doing. After bleeding out your face, Leshy will generously allow you to choose from his spares. He just happens to have an eye box. This will be his undoing. One of them looks a little more helpful than the rest. The goat eye, which makes the black goat look even more kawaii. Or you could go with the glowing wizard eye, whatever. It lets you see some secrets, I guess. Pop goes the stunted wolf. He's characteristically missing an eye and just as annoying as the others, but he does have some super secret camera film for you. Now upon being Leshy, you have him right where you want him. Oh, there's the new game button. I was just looking for that. Just like Slay the Spire, Inscription has an Act 2. But this is where the real Act 2 begins. You've been fed some video using the camera from Luke Carter, a guy who essentially found Jumanji in a mud pile and hasn't been doing well ever since. He contacted the creators of Inscription, called Game Funa, but their interests appear to be far more insidious than Luke was hoping for. Something strange has happened. You've been hearing Luke's voice as you play. Whoa. So there's only one explanation. You are Luke. You were playing as him, experiencing the game, dying over and over again, and now you're free. Or so you believed. Turns out that wasn't the real game. That was just Leshy's game, where he had control of Inscription. He is just one of four scribes, game bosses inhabiting their own secluded areas on the map with their own hapless minions working away constantly at a power grab. The talking cards you were conspiring with were actually the scribes Grimora, scribe of the dead, C-3PO, scribe of technology, and Magnificus, scribe of magics, and apparently torture. Every character Leshy played in this game was actually from this forgotten world with an old school RPG aesthetic and gameplay. 
as you explore you do battle and play the inscription card game. However, the card designs are similar yet different, the gameplay reminiscent yet distinct in its mechanics. You must seek each scribe, each as powerful as their own domain, and perhaps confer with some of the other characters in this game as well. You begin to hear whispers about something called the old data, something so dangerous it could upend the entire system, and the other scribes worry C-3PO, possibly the most dangerous of them all, might be up to something. He's been acting suspicious, seeking something called the Great Transcendence, which coming from a sentient AI that's where it's in a game can never be good. And that's just what happens. C-3PO uses his trump card, taking over the entire game with a shard of the old data. And just like that, you're in the third act, in C-3PO's domain, now with none of the other scribes in sight. You traverse his cold, sterile, artificial game board, complete with checkpoints, shops, and upgrade stations. Rather than play the characters himself, he simply loads a pre-programmed personality. The game he has you play is once again remarkably like Leshy's, and yet it leaves a very different impression. The game board is five wide instead of four. Everything is mechanical, powered by energy rather than blood and bones. Mox, a mechanic introduced in Act 2, is used in C-3PO's game to empower cards with specific colors. In order to defeat C-3PO, you must first defeat each of his special uberbots. The first being the photographer, who gets access to your screenshot function in order to reset the board to a previous state at will. The second is the archivist, who demands you access larger files on your computer to deal more damage, and will use a dear old file of your choosing to create a new special card. The third boss is literally called the unfinished boss, it's just C-3PO completely giving up and letting you construct your own boss to fight. Because this piece of junk is completely incapable and devoid of any creativity on his own, he just wants to be in control. Finally, C-3PO's least favorite boss is the ever cheerful R2-D2. I mean Gollybot, who accesses the web and uses people on your very friends list against you, giving you cards made by other online players and letting you make your own card for the next challengers. And with that, the conditions have been met for the Great Transcendence. C-3PO could not be more thrilled about it, but one of his security cameras has gone out. You've been unchained to wander about his little facility with a wildly different perspective than in Act 2, but he remains paranoid right at the moment of victory. He asks you to go check on the disturbance, and upon doing so, you are dropped into a secret basement, once again finding yourself conspiring with the other scribes hidden below, biding their time. They ask you to continue playing along, Leshy vowing to kill C-3PO while he's distracted, returning just as C-3PO begins uploading inscription to the internet. Determined to be in complete control across every iteration of the game forever and ever, Leshy emerges from the shadows and rips his head clean off. While Grimora, instead of wresting control of inscription for herself, begins the deletion process of the game, leaving nothing left but the old data. Just like Slay the Spire, Inscription has a fourth phase of sorts, but something is very different. It isn't another boss fight exactly, it's more of a countdown. You've already won, or they've already lost, depending on how you want to think about it. The timer remains constantly on screen, a loading bar ticking down to deletion, until every scrap of code is erased. But in these final moments, each scribe gets their final game with the player. You are transported first to Grimora's Crypt. She shows off her chess set, cool lighting, and you play her game before encountering the rambunctious pirate boss. <laughs> which then is deleted before she gets to even play with him. Disappointed but accepting defeat, she reaches out her hand for you to shake it, before she too is deleted. Then you were returned to Leshy's cabin with the same deck you played at the beginning of the game. Leshy seems content to be playing with you, treating you as a true equal, not bothered by the scale getting deleted midway through the game. We don't need to keep score anyways. In the final moments he has left playing the game with you, it feels strange. It suddenly makes sense why he was the scribe chosen to stay in control of the game for such a long time. He truly enjoys playing with you. You watch as all the game assets get deleted. It feels like slowly unplugging parts of an AI's brain. The cards, the board, the game itself, you're supposed to be enjoying disappearing as well. Before he vanishes, Leshy reaches out his hand with no game left to play and shakes yours just as Grimora did. Good game. Before he too enters the void. Finally, you encounter Magnificus, pleading to be saved or put back while the other scribes are gone. But he quickly gives up, opting instead to play Yu-Gi-Oh with literal dual discs. I summon what Pot of Greed to draw that? three additional cards from my deck! That's not what it does. Roll my dice! That is what it does! Pot of Greed! And I attack and I win. 
right? No! He sets 400 life points we won't even have time to burn through before everything disappears and he's left crumpled on the floor. No strength left to even shake your hand before getting deleted like the rest. Upon encountering the woodcarver, the last to not be deleted, they warn you not to open the old data, the only thing that remains, but they know you will not heed their warning. Traveling further still, you find the old data and open it, just as you were instructed not to do. It shows Luke's final moments, attempting to destroy the game disc itself before Game Funa finally catches up with him. I told you! Inscription was originally a game jam project called Sacrifices Must Be Made, created by a talented developer named Daniel Mullins who apparently has his own Mullinverse between Inscription and some of his past games like The Hex and Pony Island. While many games include the occasional secret or easter eggs, Inscription is overflowing with them, with plenty of Pixar-esque references between games reused character names, hidden clues, not to mention the entire ARG behind the scenes. Inscription delivers an entire alternate reality for the construction of the game, complete with clever ciphers that can be used in the console between Acts 1 and 2 to find dialogue options leading to a new cipher in order to discover more about the shifty characters behind the game. Casey's mod, the actual replayable roguelike, bears the same name as her death card, which indicates she and other Game Funa employees were inscribed into this game with Leshy's camera. The reason there was no new game slot at the beginning of the game is because Casey had been playing the game well before before you had. She put Leshy into power and then it fell into Luke's hands. What I really wanted to do with this video was to convey how important aesthetic can be in creating an entirely different experience. While Slay the Spire and Inscription are technically in the same category of game genre, they remain wildly distinct from one another. Slay the Spire's sense of progression relies upon unlocking bright and beautiful cards, shiny characters, and then using them in new and increasingly interesting strategies to beat the game at its very best. Inscription's goal is to mindfuck you. The progression is far more intertwined with the fourth wall breaking story and uncovering what exactly happened. You're in a crime scene as it's still developing and you're interacting with the perpetrators. The game expands well past just the game board and gives sentience to its characters beyond what most games elect to do. The very computer you play the game on is a character and this makes a fight with Leshy personal every single time from the very beginning to the last beautiful moment. Meanwhile, the final boss in Slay the Spire is a meaty punching bag that punches right back and is relentless as it tests your mettle, giving you a sense of overwhelming victory when you finally conquer it on Ascension 20. Slay the Spire has a nearly infinite replayability, with an endless number of gameplay strategies all enclosed in an addicting gameplay loop, but Inscription elects to create a carefully constructed story experience, focus on expanding mechanics to build off each other over time, while every second is just oozing an unnerving, oppressive atmosphere. With Within a single game genre, there is plenty of room for play. Hearthstone was the only single player card game I had played up to this point, with its own set of dungeon runs and unique adventures. While playing against other players in a friendly or competitive setting is very fun if you're both worthy opponents, video games offer a whole host of new single player experiences yet to be seen. There are thoughtful challenges, bosses boasting unique bullying mechanics, stunning visuals, charming animations, and the cleverest puzzles for the player to uncover. I've been really interested in how cards that might be meta in one card game struggle to find purpose in another. There's so much variation in the medium, whether it is a fast-paced game or focus on control, whether it boasts monsters or a preponderance of spells, or whether it's PvE versus PvP. The best crash course I could have asked for though was received by playing these two games back to back. It gave me insight into how far you could take a roguelike card game in either direction, whether you're looking for a challenge or a deep and engrossing story. Please experience these games for yourself. After all, nothing like a good game to pass the time. Especially if it's dual monsters. My turn! You never saw this coming! I summoned Pot of Greed to draw three additional cards from my deck! Doesn't that do is that. what it does! That's what it do, Yugi! That does what it do!